is nice. We're moving, moving along the books of the prophets. Uh, interestingly enough, although we call it the book of Shmuel, Beis, the second Shmuel, according to the Talmud, it's really one book. How it exactly got divided, it's a little unclear, but uh, it's according to the Talmud, it's really considered one, one volume. Now, the book of Shmuel was written, initially it was started, written by uh, Shmuel himself, except that he passed away in chapter uh, 28. So when he passed away, it was one of the prophets or two of the prophets that continued writing the, this historical and insightful, um, they wrote the insights of, book, of the continuation of Shmuel, obviously with divine inspiration. It wasn't their own writing. Even when Shmuel Hanavi, even the prophet Shmuel wrote it, it wasn't his own writing, but it was, of course, with divine inspiration, God divinely inspired what words to choose for writing, you know, for this, this volume. The, uh, the two prophets that we're aware of is, um, and that the, the, uh, the Talmud, understands that helped that helped finish the book of Shmuel is a prophet by the name of God, God Hachoyze. And God was one of the people, one of the, he was the prophet who had told David, who had told David in a uh, uh, few chapters earlier that he should leave the Plishtim territory and go to the people of Judah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you okay. remember that, God was the one, was one of the, he was the, um, he, he encouraged David to leave and go to Judah. And uh, it's interesting because the uh, Barbanel says that he was actually hinting to him that in the future, he will start off as king of Judah before he's accepted amongst the entire uh, Jewish people. So this is uh, this we saw in um, in the book of Shmuel Aleph, and let's just see over here. In uh, in chapter twenty two of Shmuel Aleph, in chapter twenty two, verse four. It says, God Hanavi told David, don't stay in the fortress. Go and get yourself to the land of Judah. So this is the, uh, this is the story of uh, David. Um, he went uh, to Mitzpah Mayav, and he said to the king of Mayav, let my father and mother come out here and be with you. That was when he, he brought his father and mother to uh, stay there and in the area of Moyav, and uh, until I know what to do, he was in the midst of running away from Saul, and um, he escorted them to the king of Moab. They stayed with him all the days that David was in the fortress, and then God the prophet said to David, do not stay in the fortress, go and get yourself to the land of Judah. So that is God Hanavi, or God Hachoyze. That's the God that we're mentioning here, is the author together with Nasan Hanavi, who was also well known uh, before in the book of Psalms. Nasan Hanavi is the one who rebuked David when he sinned with Bathsheba, so to speak, sinned. We don't want to use the word David sinned, but the uh, Nathan, the Navi, the prophet Nathan, Nasan, he is the one who rebuked David. And um, these are the two authors of the book of Shmuel Beis. Now, uh, if we uh, understand what's going on here, where where are we in the in the history in the, the chron chron chrono chron chronology of uh, of our history? Basically, we're at the stage where Shaul is about to die. King Saul is about to die, and David is sort of going to be the one to take over, but not exactly, because he still has, uh, we'll see, he's, he's not 
exactly um, accepted over all of Israel at this point. So Shoal is about to pass away, but David is, is meant to be king, but he's not going to be fully accepted till a number of years for a number of years. Now, the, uh, the base Hamigdash, of course, has not been built yet, but the Mishkan, which was in Shiloh, was destroyed. And the Mishkan was then um, brought to Noiv, and then Givain. And um, altogether, it was a period of 57 years in Noiv and Givain together. So like 44 years in Noiv and then 13 years of uh, um, 44 years in Givain, 13 years in Naiv, basically 57 years. And, um, and then ultimately, uh, it's brought to Yerushalayim. Now, the Arain is also, is also not there in the, Mish, in the Mishkan in Givain. The Arain is in Kiryas Yarim. We learned about that. And uh, ultimately... We are in a stage where there is no official, we don't have a full-fledged Mishkan or Beis HaMikdash at this stage. Instead, all there is, is what we call a Bama Gedoyla, a large altar. And um, normally that would have been prohibited to have an altar outside of Beis HaMikdash, but because Shiloh was destroyed, that's when it became permitted to have altars. And uh, they became prohibited once, um, once the Beis Hamikdash came into existence. So, in the time in which we had Shiloh, we were not allowed to have altars. In the time of the Beis Hamikdash, we're not allowed to have altars. And afterwards, as well, there's no, we're not allowed to have altars, uh, bamais. But um, in that in between time, it was permissible to have bamais. So that's the situation. That's the uh, the era that we're in. So we're learning the book of Shmuel Beis. We're going to start with chapter one. And let's begin. Shmuel Beis, verse, chapter 1, verse 1. By Yehi, and it was. It happened after the death of Shaul, when David had returned from striking Amalek, and David had been living in Siklag for two days. It was on the third day that, behold, a man came from the camp, from Shaul with his garments torn and with earth upon his head. When he reached David, he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, where are you coming from? He said, I escaped from the Israelite camp. And David then said to him, what happened? Tell me now. And he said that the people fled from the battle. And also many of the people fell and died. And even Shaul and Yonason, his son, died. So what we have here is a, it's a little redundant because we sort of read about their passing in the last chapter of uh, Shmuel Aleph, of, of Shmuel Aleph, which uh, Ezra was kind enough to, uh, to teach. Uh, thank you, Ezra. And uh, now we're sort of repeating this story. Uh, it's being repeated from this, uh, this person um, who uh, had come to, uh, escape, so to speak, from this war. He came to David, and uh, his garments are torn. He's mourning. He's got earth on his head, and he reached David, and he now is um, uh, going to tell him about everything that he's telling him. All that happened, and um, what it seems that he's interested in is gaining some credit. He's trying to get some brownie points. He thinks that David would be happy to hear this news that Shaul died. Why, why do you think David would be happy to hear this news? Because he will be a king then. He will well, be anointed as a king. Okay, number one, he'll be a king, possibly. What else? Hmm. Just remember what was happening. Where was David in the last uh, few years? What was yeah. David doing? He, he was, was fugitive. Yeah, he was a fugitive. fugitive. He had to run for his life. Right. So now, 
this guy thinks that David will be so happy that his enemy, the one who wants his life, is dead. So he thinks he's going to gain uh, a lot of uh, credit. Uh, he'll be uh, honored with big honors because he's telling, giving him the, such great news that your enemy uh, died. So this is, the, uh, this is how uh, this um, chapter begins with this uh, individual running to David and telling him this news. And um, uh, we'll soon see how David reacts. Does David really feel the same way this man thinks David's going to react? Now, let's see, let's see what David does. So, so David then said to him, we're in verse four, what happened? Tell me now. And he said that the people fled from battle, the battle, and also many of the people fell and died. Even Sholem Yonason, his son died. Now, verse five says, David then said to the young man who was telling him, uh, how do you know that Shaul and Yonas and his son died? The young man who was telling him said, I happened to be at Mount Gilboa. And Shaul was leaning on his spear. And behold, the chariots and cavalry were overtaking him. So in other words, he saw his end was near. He turned around and saw me. He called out to me and I answered, here I am. And he asked me, Shoal asked me, who are you? And I told him I am an Amalekite. And then he said, stand up over me and put an end to my life for the throes of death have seized me. So put an end to my life. The throes of death have seen me while my soul is still within me. So he wants him to keep, Shoal wanted this man to put an end to his life, to just help kill him. He tried to commit, Shoal tried to commit suicide. And uh, for whatever reason, it seems like he wasn't able to, it didn't work. Many people do that. They try to commit suicide, it doesn't work. So uh, Shoal begs this man to, uh, to help kill him. And he uses this interesting term, achazani hashavats, which is not a is not a, a regular word, um, hashavats. It's uh, but uh, the, uh, the the way the English translates it is uh, the throes of death have seized. But there is a there are other interpretations here. And um, one of them is, it comes from the word tashpates, ksoines tashpates, which is the, um, the kohen, one of the garments of the kohen's, the kohen's garments. And what he means is that the death that I caused to the kohenim when I destroyed the city of Nov and I killed all those kohenim, all those priests in the city of Nov, that has overcome me and I'm deservant of death now. So in other words, it's the throes of death that I caused. Not the throes of death that I'm in, but I, am, I have caused, I, that's the hint here to Shavots from the word Tashbates, from the Kasainas Tashbates, from one of the garments of the Kayanim, meaning what I caused them to die. Therefore, I, my, my, my end is, is, is happening now. And um, Rashi brings this. Now, the, the continuation of this is so I stood over him and ended his life, for I knew that he would not survive after he had fallen on his sword, I then took the crown that was on his head and a bracelet that was on his arm and brought them here to my Lord. So here he's uh, continuing this uh, uh, story by telling him that I actually killed your enemy. I killed Shoal. 
I helped him. I helped him die, and um, he probably felt that he's uh, he's bringing such good tidings for David. And um, it's interesting. The Medrash says that you know, if you think about it, one of the things that he says I brought to you something for the head and something for the arm. The Medrash says he was brought him the tefillin, his tefillin. He brought him Shoal's tefillin, the bracelet, the, uh, I took the crown that was on his head, the bracelet that was on his arm, brought them to my Lord. There's a Medrash that says that this refers to his tefillin. But uh, that's not the simple meaning. Um, the simple meaning, of course, is that he, he brought him his, his crown and his uh, bracelet. But uh, the, it, it, and it was the royal bracelet, the royal king, I mean, the crown, this is a, uh, this was a big, a big thing to hand it over to David. And that's what this man thought he was doing. He's giving him this, you know, this uh, kingship, so to speak. He's, he's, he's giving him, he's bringing the, the, the royal crown to, to David. Uh, but now we'll see what David does. Look, look, uh, let's look at verse uh, 11. And it says, David took hold of his garments and tore them. All right, answer your he did not stop, but he didn't do that other panel. I didn't catch on. You didn't catch on either. The left front panel, he didn't do it. Um, he did the right. Okay, it looks like I've got some competition yeah. over here. Yeah, there's another conversation going on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's well, I guess, uh, let me see. Okay, I think I just muted him. Okay, so uh, verse 11. David took hold of his garments and tore them as did all the people who were with him. They lamented and wept and fasted until evening over Shaul, over Jonathan, his son, over the people of Hashem, and over the house of Israel, for they had fallen by the sword. Let me just get the door for a second. Okay. So the um, the uh, the Gemara the, the Talmud says about this verse that it says David wept and all the people they tore their they took hold they, they lamented they wept fasted uh, and and it's um, he took took hold of his garments and tore them so the Talmud says that you see from here that a person is obligated to tear their garment for a nasi, a leader, the head of the court. Um, Shaul was considered the nasi, the leader. Jonathan was considered the av bezdin, the head, of the, the head of the court. And also the majority of the congregation is uh, hinted to over here in the verse for over the house of Israel, people of Hashem and over the house of Israel, a person would need to rent their garments. And um, what's interesting is if you look in the Hebrew, it's written and read a little differently. It's the word that's written is bevigdai, and the uh, way it's read is bivgadav. If you look in the Hebrew, you'll see there's two words there. One is the way it's supposed to be read. The other is the way it's supposed to be written. So the way it's written is bevigdoi, his garment, which hints to the fact that all you need to tear would be the top garment. Now, when it says bevigdoi, the way it's read is bevigdoi, meaning that David HaMelech tore all of them for each of these individuals. He tore for Jonathan, he tore for Shoal, he tore for the Jewish people who died. Now, what this clearly tells us is this, uh, this concept of tearing one's garment uh, for, a, uh, for a relative that passes away. I mean, it doesn't say here about a relative, but here it, say, it, 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 it mentions about great, for, for the great leaders that pass away. How much more so for a close relative, but what what it does show is that they did not use a ribbon. 
So I don't know where uh, people come up with this idea that, oh, let's not tear our garments. Let's just do a ribbon. It's uh, totally not a Jewish, uh, Jewish thing. Uh, and uh, if we are concerned about ruining garments, I'm sure they were a lot more concerned in those days about having garments than we are today, where you could buy garments from any store and Amazon and who knows what for very cheap. In the olden days, they were a lot poorer than we are, and uh, they easily could have bought. They, they, you know, they, they would have. They had a heart. We, we could easily buy new garments when we need uh, much, much easier than for them, and they used they, they tore their garments. And so the Gemara learns from here that a person is obligated to tear their garments for a, uh, you know, for a great, great leader. I remember when the Lubavitcher Rebbe passed away, we all tore our garments for, uh, you know, our top garment for when uh, 1994, when the Rebbe passed away. That was the, uh, for the Nasi, just similar to what, what we're reading here when, you know, it's like the, uh, the leader passed away, uh, from the, People tear their garment. Now, of course, for a uh, for a parent, a person would tear a few few of their garments. Uh, in other words, if they're wearing a jacket and a, and a shirt, they would tear both. Uh, but uh, for for a uh, nasi and for um, the av bezdin and for uh, the nation, if a majority of the nation passed away, then a person just tears. The top garment. Yes, Susan. What happens when you when a parent loses a child? So it's only one garment. Okay. It is, you know, at least what I saw in many of the funerals, unfortunately, that we attend, that it's usually a packet that people are kind of trying to, to reap. It's not necessarily a ribbon. It's just, let's see, it's, it's a packet on the outfit that people would remove or somehow to, to, to damage, to, to, to turn apart. A pocket? Pocket, yeah, it's like what you have right here. It's the pocket on your jacket, the front pocket that I saw. Some Once they're cutting the, the, the pocket, they could cut the jacket. But yes, they, they yeah, yeah, anyway. but... Yeah, abs absolutely. But, you yeah. know, it's probably Surprising. a little bit easier. Uh, now, my question is, it's kind of interesting because I read from a different source that what this uh, son of the convert was telling David was actually not truth. That uh, actually... And then we'll Shaul, talk about it. Yeah, we, Shaul, we didn't really... Shaul died from just falling on his spear. Have you have you heard of this kind of theory? Yeah, that, yeah, and yeah. yeah. And this, get person, and this person point. was waiting until Shaul was dead to remove his crown and his bracelet. And actually on the bracelet, it was a special symbol that Shaul was using as, as a, a signature on some of the documents that he did. That's, it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. And another interesting fact that Jonathan actually knowing that he would die because I think he died before Shaul. He kind of came close to his dad and their bodies were kind of next to each other, which was very symbolic, even though he had more sons, but Jonathan was one of the closest to him. Where did you read this? Um, I have to look for the sources, but I, it was a wonderful kind of additional details about this. It, have you heard of this theory? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah we're, gonna, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna mention it. It's just the verse didn't come up yet. We're gonna, we're gonna oh, see okay, the verse that, see. It, that it talks about it. But that's good. <laughs> okay. It's nice. No, add as much as add add whatever you know. Sure, Sh right. share it. Right. Don't don't hide anything. Share sure. it. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Susan, I think you're first. Anna, yeah, Anna, can I ask you a question? When you said they tore the pocket, was the pocket over the heart? Yes, yeah, it is usually. I heard of that yes. also, but it's, I don't know where. Yeah. You know, the, the women sometimes it's difficult, but for a man on a formal jacket, it is a pocket that is right over your heart. Yeah, it's just, you know, every tradition is a little bit different. So so, so the, the law is that, for, for a parent, the person tears on the left side. For mm -hmm. any other relative, you tear, the person tears on the right side. Huh. So 
So that's the so the fact that they say, you know, on the pocket, it's not it, 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 it doesn't I don't know where I don't know what the source of such a thing is. The idea is that it's on that side of the of the, uh, you know, of the chest that it's on the it's on the left side. Um, but there are many shirts that come without pockets, uh, just in case you're not aware of many of the men's shirts, even button down shirts. They, they a lot of times they even have shirts without pockets, believe it or not. We are, but, we uh, are from a cold place that so it's definitely a jacket. <laughs> no, so for a parent, a person tears both the shirt and the jacket. Sure. Um, but for uh, other relatives, it's, it's uh, you tear on the a person tears on the right side, and it's only one the uh, one garment. Um, uh, Mrs. Greenberg, Nomi, you wanted to say something. Right. The comments in this uh, Judaic Press translation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, d discuss the difference between the clothes, whether it's plural or singular, and it points out that. Uh, most people would just be tearing the garment, tearing one garment because yeah. it's one person they're mourning. But right. David uh, tore all his garments because he was mourning for not only one person, he was also mourning for uh, Yonatan and for the people of the Lord and the house of Israel. So uh, yeah. it was at least three and it looks like four garments that were actually torn and identified so uh yeah we mentioned that uh that 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 that's the difference between the way it's written and the way it's read so going one you know the the uh now when you say it's a you're not sure if it's three or four uh it's interesting because the verse is a little redundant it mentions Am Hashem, the nation of God, and it also mentions base. Let me let me mute everyone. It mentions the people of Israel. So is that the same? Is that referring to the same the same thing, or is that referring to two different groups? So um, uh, the simple understanding is it's 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 just repeating itself. It's which is common for such a uh, verse when it's lamenting over the nation. It calls them the nation of Hashem. And it calls them the the house of Israel, and which would mean it would be the same the same people, which mean he tore three garments. But uh, there is a Malbum explains that Am Hashem refers to the Sanhedrin, so this would this would mean the the uh, it would be four according to according to that interpretation, because it's it's actually a different uh, it's referring to a different group the, the Shaul Yonason the Sanhedrin and the uh, people of Israel, so it would mean that it was actually four. Uh, Now the the Talmud does talk about a person who has one garment, but they need to tear a few. Uh, they need to tear more than one tear. That there is an option to tear more. Tear you tear the person would tear a little and then just tear an extra tear, or possibly turn it to the back and, and tear from the from their new front the, the, uh, the tear, tear there as well. So even if David was not wearing four garments, he could have done four tears on different parts of the garment, so to speak. Okay, now the uh, the story over here with this man uh, from Amalek um, telling David about the death of Shaul and Yainasan and mentioning that he himself uh, killed Shaul. And um, Anna had mentioned that it's, uh, it's a little questionable about his story because if you look at the previous chapter, it implies that uh, the previous chapter, meaning the last chapter of Shmuel Aleph, uh, it implies that Shaul died from his, uh, his suicide. He leaned on, the, on his sword and he died. So what, is, what exactly is this, is this uh, Molochite man saying that he killed him? So we're going to soon see. So let's uh, just stay tuned. Um, there's a number of questions that could be asked as well. Uh, what was this Amalekite man doing here? Uh, is he really from Amalek? And, um, okay, but we'll soon see. Let's, let's continue. What we are seeing is that David uh, tore the garments over this death of 
which is surprising to us. We would think that he would be rejoicing. I would think he would make a champagne party or something. And instead, he's uh, he's very sad, tearing his garment and lamenting, fasting. And um, not only for Yonason, which is understandable, but for Shoal. And uh, David asked, then asked, we're in verse 13. David then asked the young man who was telling him, where are you from? David then asked the young man who was telling him, he said, where are you from? And he replied, I am the son of an Amalekite convert. Ben Ish Ger Amoleki Anoichi in the Hebrew. Now that itself is also questionable. Before he called himself an Amalekite, now he's saying he's a Amalekite Ger. He's a convert from Amalek, the son of a convert from Amalek, or possibly he, he means I am a stranger from Amalek and I'm not a Ger. There are another tr- translation of the word Ger. Ger could mean a stranger, meaning I don't, I'm not from the Jewish faith, I, but I live in your area. I am a Ger here. I am a, a stranger in your, that lives in your midst. I, we moved here and my father moved here. I am the son of a, a Malachite Ger who came to live here. To... Now, uh, and, and the, both of these are interpretations that are mentioned. Now, David then said to him, how could you not be afraid to send forth your hand to destroy the anointed one of Hashem? How could you do something like that? You killed the anointed one of Hashem, Shoal HaMelech? So David then called one of the attendants and said, approach and strike him down. So he struck him and he died. And David said to him, your blood is on your own head for your own mouth testified against you saying, I put to death the anointed one of Hashem. So here we have uh, David uh, puts him to death, basically. He tells his uh, his, uh, uh, attendant to put him to death and he feels he did the right thing. Put to death the anointed one of a. I put to death, uh, you know. Uh, you claim that you're you. You put to death the anointed one of Hashem. You deserve to die, and he killed him. Uh, yes, Yehuda. Are Amalekites allowed to convert? Um, so Amalek is not one of the seven nations. So theoretically, they they could they could convert. Well, I, I thought we're supposed to um... kill all of them. We're also supposed to kill all the seven nations. And um, there is a discussion about the seven nations if they want to, if they convert, if they would, if they were to convert, would we, uh, would we accept them? But uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the fact that uh, someone could convert from a Malik is, uh, is, uh, you know, it says that Haman had uh, had uh, children that converted. They learned right. Taira in Bnei Brak. Mm. So uh, there is such a source that you have. Uh, it's Gemara. The Gemara says that uh, uh, Haman had right, grandchildren right. that learned Torah. So it seems like uh, uh, that it's it's not an issue. Mm. Okay. But what is interesting is if the story is true that this man says that he killed Shaul. Uh, it's very interesting that Shaul sinned that he didn't kill out Amalek. And what happened? An Amalekite ended up killing him in the end. Oh, wow. So that is an interesting uh, point that Amalek, he didn't do his job. And uh, it ended up that uh, he fell into the hands of an Amalekite. But there are a number of questions that deserve to be answered here, especially with David killing this man. Why did he kill him? He, he claimed that you, you admitted that you killed someone, that you killed the uh, Shoal. So therefore, you deserve death. Well, that doesn't, doesn't work that way in Jewish law. If someone admits that they killed someone, we don't go and kill them unless there's, unless there's witnesses you can't just kill someone because he admits that he did a uh, capital, he did a, uh, a crime that deserves capital punishment. 
we don't uh, we don't accept such a uh, um, such a statement to allow you know to allow us to do the death penalty on someone just because they 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 uh, admit that they sinned. Um, and so, how did David feel that he could go and, and kill this person? There were no witnesses. And uh, who says the man was saying the truth? And uh, was there, did he go to, did he have a court case? Did he, did he allow, you know, did he allow the man to defend himself and, and, and speak up for himself? Did he, and, uh, you know, did he, did he do the, the due process of, uh, of uh, legal, uh, you know, the way go, going through the legal system? It seems like he just went and killed him. And so we're, how could he do such a thing? Uh, additionally, you could say, I mean, maybe Shoal asked him to. So he was listening to the king. He followed the king's command. So you might say that he was even supposed to kill him. So this is uh, discussed, of course, among the, the commentaries, and especially uh, it's even brought in the Rambam. The Rambam himself talks about this case. And he mentions that this was a unique situation called a Hoiroas Shah, a uh, extraordinary circumstance, special situation where um, David HaMelech felt, uh, used his uh, license that he was, was allowed to uh, um, uh, safeguard the Torah on, on, on unique and unique uh, situations. And um, he... Uh, he, 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 he decided this was the, the time that it was necessary. Like there are situations where a person, where a great leader, a great prophet has the ability to do something that's against the Torah. And uh, it's for a one-time moment because they feel it's, uh, this is uh, um, of utmost importance. Uh, an example of this would be uh, Elijah, in the Har HaKarmel, in, uh, in, uh, in Haifa, uh, when Elijah uh, brought, a, uh, uh, brought a sacrifice on Mount Carmel in, 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 in order to prove that God is, 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 is the only God and all the prophets of Baal are nonsense. And uh, Eliyahu did this. Uh, to uh, it's called a hayra shah, a, a momentary uh, act that 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 is necessary to to, to uh, for the benefit of the the Jewish people. So, what did David really think? Why why was this beneficial to the entire Jewish people? What did they need this for? Why did the people need a, a teaching, a lesson about? You know this man that what he did was wrong. Like what? What were they really? What, what did what? What did they need to learn from this? Why was this a such an important time? A hayras shah of uh, of a moment of of edu like an educational moment. That that's like a hayras shah, like a moment of where it's so necessary. The people need to know this. Um, why did he? Why did David feel this was the the time that it was critical? to teach them this lesson. So uh, let's see, uh, uh, um, Naomi, I think you, did you want to answer this question? I, I can't hear you, you're muted. You want the to so answer this question? Yes, the source okay. that I'm using says that David thought that the Amalekite was lying, that he did it to make himself um, okay, but if you lie, do you deserve the death penalty? That seems like a very harsh punishment for lying. People lie it, all the time. It, it's, it actually says that he didn't want him to be an example for other people. So, in other words, you kill someone from lying because other people might learn to lie? Uh, that sounds a little extreme, no? And I, I, think, I don't know. I'm... I'm uh, I'm just to me, it sounds. I understand. And you're right. There is such a commentary that that he that um, 
um, that that he you know that he seemed like, like he wasn't saying the truth. But I'm I'm wondering logically how how, how we're supposed to understand this. Um, yes, Anna. I believe that it mentioned several times that what Hashem actually anointed to do, uh, human being have no judgment to change. That's how I would would interpret that. That if he was, he was, uh, you know, was said to be a king, a simple person cannot decide if it is for him to live or to die. And especially to bring all of his attributes, his crown and his bracelet to someone else and to say, now I anoint you to be a king. I think it's a good example for people to understand that some of the things are above their judgment, that they cannot really take the power in their own hands. Uh -huh. So it's like teaching people not to be a vigilante, uh, uh, you know, violent. Uh, no, uh, what, what, what God decides a human cannot, cannot change, cannot really change, you know, make a different decision. Yeah, but I'm saying, why did he go and, and kill him? because he felt there's something, some important message. I believe that this person, people. this person was guilty of a several different crimes. It's uh -huh. not only to kill a king, which is questionable because why did he bring just the, the crown and the bracelet? It definitely sounds like he tried to gain some score for this action. He definitely did not show any remorse of doing it. Third, it's just in the previous chapter, we saw that actually a person that Shaul asked to kill him refused. That's why it's a very, very kind of questionable thing to do. And third, I truly believe that David, David so many times in his actions, even though he was a very, very compassionate person, he really believed that it's not his right to change what was required, what was decided by Hashem. And he was anointed to be a, a king, Shaul. That's why to come to David and to say, here, I brought you some things. Now you are a king. It was not really morally right to, to David. That's why he believed that this person was guilty for several different crimes moral and physical right okay so you're taking a different path and i was going on because you're explaining that maybe he he was guilty of death penalty while i'm taking the the path <laughs> that he's not exactly guilty fully guilty of the death penalty but there are scenarios in uh jewish law that a person who's not guilty of the death penalty the court or the the the, the head the the king has the right, the prophet, the king, they have the right to do something that's not exactly along the line of the letter of the law, but they have that license once in a blue moon, if they feel this is an important, extraordinary, critical importance to teach the nation something, this would be allowed. You know, what would be really a good, good thing for him to do if he really meant well, is to bring a body of the Shaul to David and to give it, give it a, a normal and, and appropriate burial. That's, that's the, not, not the crown and the jewels. This is one thing. Second, in my opinion, we are talking about a war situation and it's not a war where, you know, it could be lost or, or won or win of, or lose. It's a situation for survival. That's why someone who could betray his own brothers later on would probably be a very dangerous person to keep in your camp. That's uh -huh. my opinion. Well, we don't know if he's even a brother, but because uh, no, we I don't mean, know exactly who he is. Yeah, yeah, but, that's uh, why. But anyway, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, disagreeing that there are, you know, that there might be an interpretation that, he was guilty himself of the death penalty, but the common understanding, at least of the uh, popular commentaries, is that this was a hayra shah. This was a unique opportunity. So we're trying to figure out what could be the reason. Uh, what, what what was this educational purpose of teaching the people 
something. What, like, what, what, what exactly was David teaching everyone? So on the one hand, uh, one of the commentaries explains that he was teaching him that, teaching the people about how dangerous, how, how wrong it is to kill a king, the anointed one of Hashem. In other words, when someone is chosen as king, for, for someone to go and assassinate him, that is absolutely uh, something that you have to stay far, far away from. And especially we know David HaMelech felt this way because he himself had opportunities to kill Shaul and he even was le- legally allowed to kill Shaul and he didn't. And so David sort of uh, lived this way that, you know, you're not allowed to touch the anointed one of Hashem. And so he wanted, he, he felt this is a very important to teach the nation this. And, um, and that would be a... Uh, especially appropriate now that the kingdom of Israel is a little up in the air. So it's a time that there might be assassination thoughts and not specifically for his own benefit, but in t- for the Jewish people to have a, a real government and real stability that they shouldn't have. It shouldn't be a war zone. So, so, so that would be the, the thought. Um, that would be one explanation of, of David Amelech teaching this to the people, this very important point. Another, another uh, uh, point that should be mentioned is that because there, there were two sides over here, there was David's group, and he, we know he had like 400, 600 people, families with him, and it was growing, and we had Shoal Hamelach, who had the entire nation with him, and uh, there were, you know, these were two groups of, of competing in a certain sense, there was there was some competition there. There was some fighting. There was some uh, um, issue of uh, uh, you know uh, um, two two sects that uh, were not exactly seeing eye to eye. So some wild, violent people might think this was an oper- This is maybe a good thing to do. We should kill people from now. Shoal died. Let's take advantage of the opportunity and maybe wipe out some more people from Shaul's army and Shaul's people. So David wanted to set the word straight, set the rule straight, and say, no, this is not an opportunity to go killing people. People, in fact, I am, this person who tried to kill someone from, who tried to kill Shaul Amalek himself, he's getting punished with the death penalty, and therefore, this is not a free-for-all at this point, and it never should be a free-for-all. Life is not, is, is not a free-for-all. And therefore, you might be on the other side and you might even be with me and you might think that I'm going to be happy. It's not true. I will, we, we, this is absolutely uh, prohibited to go and take advantage of this time and try to go kill people from the other, from the other army, from the other Jewish army. Uh, yes, Susan. David had an opportunity several times to kill Shoal, but he didn't but he had a, a very high, he didn't want to kill the, the anointed one that Hashem said should be king. Right. I mean, David had a very high standard. And he, but he wanted to, I think, prove that even though that he killed that, had a, a, somebody killed that man, that man's own life was his own blood. He, he did it and it was something that he was responsible for. The guy that died was responsible for his own death. That's what David, I, I think that's what it, it says in here. I, I'm not, but I'm not sure. I mean, I'm only reading the English. Uh, it says that he, that he, the guy. David that, felt, felt no guilt in having him killed. Right. David felt he did and the right he, thing. Yes. That that guy was deserving of his death. Right? Yes, exactly. That, it, that he was responsible for his own death because of how he acted by right. bringing, right. Which, which means, which is not a contradiction, although you're asking a challenging question because what you're saying is it sounds from that verse that this was not a Shah, he deserved his death. So it sounds like you're asking a very strong question that it sounds like he maybe did deserve death. It, uh, not, not just a Shah, an opportunity to set a rule straight, to do some... Uh, you know, some educational lesson for the entire people. From the verse, it does sound like he maybe was uh, deservant of death fully. And, and the answer, to answer your question, is that um, it, 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 it's true 
He was deservant of death, but in the regular rules of Judaism, we might not be, have been able to take to give him that full punishment according to the according to the rules, even though he's deservant of death and he's guilty of death, but we might not, we might need to wait for witnesses and so on, and we right. might need to go through the regular system. And uh, in this scenario, he didn't have to. David did yeah. not have to. But not that he wasn't deservant of death. He was, he was still deservant of death, yeah. but uh, we didn't go through the regular the right regular channels. Method. In other words, the right channels. Yeah. Right. Yes, uh, Ezra. Why, why can't we say that David was the Goel Hadam? in this particular case mm -hmm. and the reason and the reason and the reason that i say that is because uh shaul is a relative if in fact this individual did kill a relative and he admitted it to him directly then david is in fact the goel hadam and has mm -hmm. a perfect right to kill this individual uh-huh yeah. Very uh, brilliant thinking, uh, as very interesting, uh, very uh, interesting thought um, that uh, that uh, uh, David would consider himself a Goyal Hadam. Um, and, and, you know, you have to understand that in, in everything that, he, that uh, David did with Shaul, he was always showing that he never had any negative intentions against him. And so, therefore... <laughs> He always considered himself to be part of the family. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, in this particular situation, I, I would think that his reaction is that of a, you know, could be that of a Goel Hadam. Mm -hmm. So what, what Ezra is mentioning there, I don't know if everyone knows what a Goel Hadam, a Goel Hadam is the avenger of blood, of blood when someone murders someone after the court gives, uh, you know, gives you the... Uh, uh, you know, says Sorry. the person de deserves death. So then the Goyal Hadam has the right to go and kill him. Or if the person doesn't run away to the city of refuge and so on, or, or runs to the city of refuge and then escapes from the city of refuge. So the, the, the avenger of blood has the right to go and, and kill them. Um, and so uh, uh, the way Ezra sees it is the person, this, that uh, uh, David is maybe the avenger of blood for Shoal, Rebbe. especially because a lot of Shoal's kids passed away. Now, Shoal did have a son, who we'll see, uh, lives. So would, you know, would uh, David really fall into the category of the Goyal Hadam? That's an interesting question. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, we'd have to look look through the laws of Goyal Hadam to see, especially because Shoal claimed that he's not married anymore. He's an ex, or the, the, he never actually was married to his daughter. Shoal, the way, the way Shoal... Uh, um, uh, felt and he married uh, his daughter Michal to someone else, claiming that the marriage was not a, a proper marriage. But uh, David did consider it a proper marriage, so that would give room to say maybe, like Ezra saying, that he was a relative, at least according to David's view. David felt he's related to Shoal. Shoal felt he's not related to David, um, but uh, but David did feel he's he he is related to uh, to. Uh, uh, to, to Shaul, even though he doesn't know where his wife is at this point, because his wife had uh, uh, gone back with Shaul, and uh, uh, and, and truthfully, she was, interestingly enough, she was married. Her yeah. father forced her to marry someone else, even though she herself was unsure. Um, uh, she herself was unsure, uh, you know, uh, is her husband right or her father right about their marriage? And she ended up going with another man, but they never had relations together because of this issue where her husband was the, um, he was the uh, epitome of self-control, where he was forced into a room with his new wife, Michal, and, uh, but he was nervous to have relations with her because he was afraid that David was really still married to her. So he put a, they put an, uh, a knife in the bed, in the middle of the bed a sword and uh, saying, uh, you know, if we have relations, we would be deservant of death. And they, therefore, the rest of his, for, for his entire time, since she was, as long as Shoal was alive, they did not have relations. And uh, ultimately, Michal uh, 
comes back to uh, to, to to David. But um, and because she never had relations with anyone else in this inter in this uh, interim. But um, uh, uh, the the uh, the question of Goyal Hadam is an interesting question. I guess we'd have to look up the laws of Goyal Hadam and see if if, if he would fall into that category, especially because a David. Does he for sure know, like, can he rely on this person's own testimony that he is, that he murdered him? And can he be, uh, do we know that he died? Do we know that there's no other relatives? Do we know, you know, I, I think there's a number of questions that have to be asked, but it is a very interesting Rebbe, thought, Ezra. Yes, Rebbe, uh, Isaac. Yes. The question is where they have to be asked. I mean, I'm always concerned about process. What is the procedure you went through to get the authority to do what you're doing? And it's not a Hefka belt. You don't have a self-appointed Gole Hadam. It has to be appointed by a Besden. So to say that she killed and therefore he took upon himself to be the Goyal Hadam, I believe, is inconsistent with Halacha. Right. Uh, I, I'm but not disagreeing. With that. I, 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 I sort of uh, touched upon that. But yes, uh, as Rabbi. you say, we, we have to look it up. We have to look it up. Yes. But he's the, he is the king. He appointed someone to execute him. So therefore, he is in fact the individual who has made that decision. Okay, we have to see if that fits. But uh, it's 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 it definitely it's an interesting thought. I think it's a, a brilliant thought. I think it uh, it, it has to be uh, looked into if it fits with the rules. Of the Goyal Hadam, and uh, we could look at the Hilchas Reitzayach and the Rambam, and see if it, if it fits in that if it fits in the rule and the rules. I, of course, there's a Mishnah in, in Tractate Makos that talks about the uh, Goyal Hadam would wait in the Ir Miklot uh, until uh, until the court case, because even even a person who killed on purpose would, would wait there until the time came for the court case and decide if the you know if if, uh, if they're guilty. Um, uh, the other question would be is, is, is the fact that he was told to kill him by the king, would there be a rule of Goyal Hadam in this scenario? You know, would, would the, would, it, maybe he didn't do the wrong thing. I, you know, it's, 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 it, it's not exactly a clear cut, um, such a clear cut case either. Okay, so in any event, we've got uh, these different uh, questions about the story here and my time is just about up. So what we're going to do is, um, let's see, we only have one minute left. Let's just uh, continue okay. a little more of the story for uh, another minute or two. David lamented this dirge over Shaul and Jonathan, his son. He said, we must teach the children of Judah the archer's bow. Behold, this is written in the book of up, uprightness. And um, David is about to uh, give like a little poem, uh, a dirge, uh, uh, lamenting over the over this sad uh, episode of uh, uh, the losing the, the, these um, Shaul and Yehina son losing their life, and many many of the Jewish people dying and uh, losing to the army to the uh, Plishtim army. And so he starts off with this interesting statement of we have to teach the children of Yehuda the archer's bow. And this is what's written in the book of Yashar, the book of Yashar. Now, what does this mean? And why is he mentioning about the children of Judah when we're talking about the children of uh, Benjamin? We're talking about the Shoal and Yohanan's son. They're from uh, Benjamin, from the tribe of Benjamin. And so... One of the explanations is he didn't start, this is before he gives his lament, he's mentioning this because he's emphasizing that uh, we shouldn't be worried. We are going to ultimately be victorious. We're going to teach the children of Judah the archer's bow, and we are going to win. We're going to win wars because now uh, I will, uh, you know, you'll be in the hands of Yehuda, who's meant to be, to do warfare, and we will ultimately uh, be successful. Now, another explanation, and I, I should mention, and that's written in the book of uprightness, that 
it's meant that uh, Judah is meant to be the one who's going to be leading, uh, fighting the enemies. Right? This is, a, this is written in the uh, Yehuda. Um, your hand, your hand will be in the neck of your, in the, uh, in the neck of your enemies. In other words, you will murder, you will kill, you will win over all the enemies. And, um, and so that's in the book of Yashar. Yashar is considered the book of the righteous, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the book of Genesis. According to some explanations, going to others, it means the book of the Torah. The Torah is a book of Yashar. Another third explanation, say for a Yashar, is a, a book that talks about military methods. It was a secular book. But ultimately, um, what uh, David Amalekh is saying is that although the loss is very tragic, but the Torah assures us that we will ultimately vanquish all of our enemies. And uh, another explanation is that until now, we were sort of relying on miracles. Shaul HaMelech leading the Jewish people was a uh, in a certain sense, it was sort of like relying, it was uh, doing, uh, you know, we are relying on the merit of the righteous. Now, because they passed away, we're going to have to actually do things according to nature. And there are interpretations like this, that the uh, Benjaminite rule is based on uh, miracles, and the Judah rule is based on nature that the actual the kings are actually warriors and they're actually going to win so there is such a concept in fact what we find is how did david hamela how did david kill goliath goliath he killed him in a miraculous very miraculous way when did he do that david killed goliath when who was king benjamin when in other words uh Joel, when saul was king there were miracles that were taking place in the wars when david was king it was done more with with uh, special, with, with the knowledge of how to fight wars. So in a certain sense, we find that David HaMelech is saying, oh, we lost our, our merit, the merit of the righteous. Now we're going to have to actually fight. Until now, we were, we were in fact, that's why um, uh, the Jewish people were not supposed to have a king in the time of Benjamin, because we were living by miracles. We didn't need a king. In the time of David, later on, that's when we need a king. We need to fight wars like a king. But in the time of Shaul, we were meant to live more by miracles. So that's a very interesting idea that, in other words, the God was upset that they asked for a king then, because really at that time, we weren't supposed to have a king. And even though Shaul was, a, was anointed as king because we asked for it, it wasn't the right thing. And even then, when we asked for the king, God made it like miraculous type of wars. And therefore, we... Uh, David Amalek was able to kill Goliath with a, a slingshot, like a very shocking way to, to win a, a major, uh, he was, Goliath was, a, was, was so big, huge, a giant. And David Amalek, a little tiny, uh, uh, unprofessional, uh, you know, uh, fights with a slingshot, and he kills him. So that is the, uh, another explanation, and that's based on a Jerusalem Talmud. Now, the uh, third explanation is that... Um, um, David Amelach is saying that, um, uh, very interesting, that he's saying that we have to teach the um, B'nai Yehuda kashas. Kashas does not mean armor or a, a bow. It means painfulness. That we have, to, we have to make sure that the people of Judah, although we were fighting with Shaul, with Saul, we have to make sure that they have proper sadness over the death of Shaul. And we shouldn't be proud and happy, but on the contrary, this is a great loss. The man who wore the uh, crown of the Jewish people, the, uh, the crown of leadership, and uh, this is a terrible, terrible time, and we should teach the Jewish people of uh, uh, the people of Judah that this is a time of painfulness, and they shouldn't be happy about the downfall of, so to speak, their enemy, who's one of, who's one of their, their own. On the contrary, we have to be pained and, um, and broken over this, uh, over this great loss. And that is from the uh, Barbanel. Okay, uh, we're gonna have to conclude here. Zai Gesund, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye, Rabbi.